going straight into it. Always straight into Mark it. Mark Marin style. You never know what you're going to uh, miss. Completely so. raw. Do you do an uh, intro at all, or we just go into it? Um, I mean, I'm going to do a little intro with you to tell you kind of about the pod in case you have any questions, but I'll probably tack on a little intro if we need it. Oh, before we even do this? So yeah, what yeah. I'm asking right now is should I stop talking and let you lead it, or should I make comments about thank you for the, the steno pad and the blue pen and the the water? Like, it, it makes me feel like I'm the host of it. Like, so what, what do we want to talk about today? I know. It's kind of like I saw Bill Maher on Friday, and he had Howard Stern on. And basically Stern kind of started interviewing him and it was quite funny. Oh yeah. He can't help it. He's the best. He's the best. He's the best in the whole world. Yeah. You know the story about him and his, or it's a kind of short story where uh, his dad never paid attention to him, but his dad always just wanted to listen to the radio. So Howard Stern growing up was like, the only way I can get this man's attention is if I'm in that radio. So it's like this deeply rooted need for, for love. So he had to become the best broadcaster yeah i mean I, I, you got to respect a guy who's going to go all the way and just give it everything and yeah totally take over king of all media right mm-hmm. yeah so the, yeah and so, his little strategies about how he knew the ratings would dip at like twelve thirty five or whatever and then would say the most outrageous offensive thing right at then so it would spike back up so he yeah. just he could control it like silly putty and yeah, yeah i don't know it's getting harder and harder to do that i guess with today's world it's harder to be like the king of anything in any media. Like that's why this old stars don't go away. That's why Mariah Carey is still a star. That's why like Madonna is still a star because they don't make new stars that command all the attention. Like they just die. Yeah. Michael Jackson dead, you know, and I was going to name. He's still around though. He's still around, but like there's, who's the next Michael Jackson? Who's the next Prince? Ooh, no one. No one. Next Kurt Cobain. It's like, uh, there, there's many ones, but they're not going to have the same impact because there's too many copies and we're used to it. And there already was one. But the way that, I don't know, like when you study the phenomenon of the Beatles and how uh, it was right at the like time of birth control or something. Yeah. So like women's liberation coincided with it, which allowed them to be these teen girl fans that couldn't be as big as, I mean, I guess Elvis was pretty big, but Beatles was just the next level of it. And yeah. I don't know, so much of it is what's going on at the time and not so much those individual humans. And it was somewhat engineered from what I understand, Beatlemania. Like they made sure the crowds were there the first time they landed. And oh, could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not to say that they weren't like no, not to say completely that they were bad, but. like badass as musicians and put in the 10,000 hours or mm-hmm. whatever and had great chemistry and all that blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I'm sure there's a huge marketing aspect to it too. Yeah, that that's the always been. the side of the other coin with all art is like, okay, I got to tweet. Oh, I got to Instagram. Oh, I got to do all this stuff to support the art and to build awareness around it yeah unless you're of that old class like the old comedian that had a sitcoms like i don't do social media it it kind of is i hate to even talk like this but you know it's it's a privilege to not have to do it oh major privilege yeah especially if you're an actor like even the young actors who have made it like rami malek from uh Bohemian Rhapsody, like he's got and Mr. Robot. Let's and not forget oh, Mr. I love, Robot. I love Mr. Robot. It's one what of my a great shows. dude! And seems like to be really nice, which is the new type of celebrity. You can't be a dick face. Right? Nineties, you had to be a dick face. Had to be a dick. And he's Sherman Oaks, so he's right up the street from where really? we are. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Went to the Catholic high school, I believe, up the street. Really? What is is he? A uh, Lebanese or he's Ar- Egyptian? Egyptian. That's yeah, right. Yeah. What are you again? Moroccan. Moroccan. Damn, yeah. both very cool, How exotic, Iranian. Iranian. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not as exotic as those two. Egypt, you think the pyramids were Moroccan, Moroccan mint tea, the big circle bed, the, the. I don't know, you, you feel like you're on vacation in Iran, you think of like, oh, Iran, Contra, are we going to war with Iran, the Muslim extremist revolution of the 70s, and yeah. all that. Persian, you can get uh, exotic, like, oh, Persia, Aladdin, so sometimes Iranians say they're Persian, sometimes if they want to play more of the ethnic victim card thing like oh iran but when you want to sound exotic ooh, persian right yeah fancy but i mean i think iranians are just like one branding situation away from like the whole rebrand like i mean because iranians and armenians kind of share similar heritage yeah look very similar too and there can be iranian armenians from what i understand oh yeah i'm not the expert but me neither Never even been there. Oh, no? No, never been to the Middle East even. Never been to Iran, Iraq. So you were born in Canada? Yep. Where in Canada? Sarnia, Ontario. Sarnia. Yep. Wow, I don't even know where that is, and I'm Canadian. It's about 45 minutes from Toronto, I think. 
It's very small. Do you tell Americans Sarnia or do you say Toronto? I say Canada, and uh-huh. then they say where, and then I say Sarnia, Ontario. Then I just knock them both out, but I'm not going to start with Sarnia, Ontario. <laughs> to be like, what, comma, what? Right, yeah. But, And how long ago did you move to the U.S.? U.S., we moved when I was about 11 or 12, something like that. And uh, we moved to Lake Jackson, Texas. Then I oh. went to school at the University of Texas, which is in Austin. Yep. Hung around there for a bit. Moved out to L.A. in uh, 2013. I think. Wow. Oh, so you move with the fam. Nice. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to do the adult immigration, which is a fun thing when you're Canadian trying to come to the US. Oh, yeah. It's got to be a visa. huge pain in the ass. Yeah. No, I had a green card. I didn't even know what a green card was. I got citizenship without thinking about it. Just kind of your parents email you the thing to fill out. I've very much been a. So much paperwork I've just kind of grifted through, whether it's school or citizenship. Just It just kind of happened. I didn't have to work hard. Yeah. Well, maybe at. Six minutes is a good time to tell the listeners, who are you? Who is Sure. Ramin? So let's see, as far as what I do, I'm currently wearing the artist hat more than anything. I make a lot of uh, visual art and animation and uh, music as well. I was also, uh, I still am, you know, stand-up comedian, but I'm focusing less time on that and putting more time into the the, you know, just kind of making shit rather mm-hmm. than trying to build the, the hour, which I have. I have utmost respect for the people working on their hours and stuff right. like that. But I don't know, you you go towards where you're interested in. I know that in having a laser focus on one thing, you're more likely to succeed at that one thing, but I can't help it. I have that attention fractured thing where I'll care a lot about, you know, the comics or something for a while and then really care about uh, animation and really care about stand up or mm-hmm. really care about music, and then the other stuff kind of atrophies a little yeah. as I'm doing that. So, I think in this new environment, it's okay to light a bunch of fires around in your different art projects because you don't really know which one's going to be the one to take you to the next level. Yeah, and once you go to the next level, they all kind of get pulled up with you. Yeah, and you also don't want to be, um, Sometimes if you get too big at one thing, then your attempts at other things might suffer. For example, I don't know, Steve Martin, maybe he is the best banjo player or very, very good, but he's forever <laughs> going to be Steve Martin. And right. if he writes a novel, most people are going to be like, Psh, she's writing a novel. Come on, put the put the arrow through your head again or go back with the white suit. Like, why are you like being a banjo hack or whatever yeah. like that? But he's probably really good and it's probably really enjoyable. Or uh, There used to be situations where like, in, even in acting, like TV actors couldn't cross over to movies. They'd be like, oh, is he a TV actor? Yeah. And that, now that was TV's like, bigger than movies. Yeah, that was the 90s. You're like, we, we don't want these actors from Friends in movies. Yeah. And now it's like all oh, one thing. You can be in, you go from movie to TV and back, and it's so much more fluid. And commercials. And Remember commercials, they had to yeah. do commercials like in Japan, but it'd be secret because right. they're doing a shampoo commercial and you're Brad Pitt. You shouldn't be lowering yourself like that. And now there's people doing, we know the banks are evil, and there's people doing commercials for the banks and... On their social media, they're all about, you know, the resistance and progress and do this. But yet they're like, yeah, I'll do a commercial for, for the, the chase the, card. Yeah. Yeah. And um, which I would, too. I would completely do a commercial for a bank. Fuck it. Uh, now. Now uh, <laughs> he's taking offers, guys. Chase, yeah, it's all, Wells Fargo. It's over. Who cares? Yeah. Indy I'll do Mac anything. Bank. Oh, wait, they're out of business. Uh, any bank who wants a nice animated commercial. You're <laughs> yeah. in. What bank do you use? Wells Fargo, it's the worst. I was reading this book by uh, this finance guy, Ramit Sethi, who, so I love reading finance books. Oh, me too. Look at my shelf. Hell yeah. Let's see what you got. Building financial models, evil twins, twins, triplets. That's for parenting. Sorry. Uh, uh, Commando workout. That's for fitness. Where's the finance ones? Business and valuation. Ooh, yeah. These are dense. Mine are, mine are mostly lit and f- written for the lay person, mostly targeted towards people not good with money. So it's like easily, easy to digest, whether it's, you know, Jen Sincero, you're a badass at making money or Gary Vaynerchuk or, or oh, Dave yeah, Ramsey yeah. or that bullshit. Then there's the other side, which is the, the woo woo side, the law of attraction. Right. And, uh, War of Art. Yeah. War, War of Art is more practical. It doesn't yeah. get into the metaphysical stuff, but I like I like holding the metaphysical and the, the books that say there's no such thing as the secret. You got to get up every day at four in the right, morning yeah. and do all that stuff. But uh, I was. Why do you say you're bad with money? Just naturally, because I'm. I don't care about looking at numbers and spreadsheets. I love creating stuff. I love the world of the. 
you know, the right brain world more than the left brain world. I've had to build the left brain out of, out of necessity so that I can continue to do the right brain stuff, not as a hobby. I don't want to just do art as a hobby and then right. have a day job. I want yeah. them to be like merged souls into one thing. Right, they can right, do. right. That's the whole theme of the podcast. It's exactly. Show business. Yeah. Do it. Don't forget the show part, but especially don't forget the business because right. it's the foundation. Yeah. And if you've just got a business and no show, that might be all right for some, but your soul might be suffering if you do have that. Right. Or if you lean too much into the business versus the, you know, the art. And then you're like, you're kind of an artist, but mostly you're a marketer. Yeah. You're kind of selling yourself too fast. Living to work, not working to live. Right. Or like you see a lot of artists, especially in music, like they're putting out their first thing they recorded and they're like promoing it and like, Shoot, using the Instagram video, like, oh, about to release my first blah, or like, I'm away to this audition, like, selling it before you have it. Yeah. And then having to walk it back. Which you you did have to do it that way before, like the teaser, so people would know about it. But yeah. right now, yeah, you even if you release a full thing with no announce, announcement, that's old news. Beyonce did that like 10 years oh, ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Releasing 17 music videos fully produced in an album with yeah. no promo showing that. Yeah. Now Beyonce you release did. it, then you figure out if it's good. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like that thing with the uh, brands, like people and companies work to have a brand, but at the end of the day, the brand, your brand is what your fans tell you your brand is. So you can be like, oh, Wells Fargo, I'm about like, you know, solidarity and with my customers. And then a financial crisis happens with their, you know, internal marketing and like, no, this brand is now about this. Yeah. (laughs) So you can try hard, but at the end of the day, you're the people who use your product and services, they're going to also give you a lot of feedback about where you actually sit in the brand space. I don't think most people are happy with their bank though, the same way that they might be with their favorite restaurant or something. I think we stay with our bank out of necessity and we know that it it is a lesser evil thing. And if you switch to a credit union, then, you know, their website sucks. There's not a branch everywhere. There's not an ATM nearby. So I stay with Wells Fargo because yeah, I know that they started what, 22 billion or whatever of fake accounts and futzed with their numbers. And it's just... It's really bad, and that's the stuff we see. But Mm -hmm. am I changing it? No, because that takes an afternoon and some research. But the reason I brought the Ramit Sethi, I Will Teach You to Be Rich book up was because he lists his favorite banks and credit unions and his least favorite. And Bank of America and Wells Fargo are his top two, like, worst banks. Don't ever fuck with them. Uh, He has a list of credit cards that are the best for rewards, best for travel, like how it's good to have credit cards. It builds your credit if you pay them off in time as opposed to someone with no credit card. So it kind of teaches you the practical nature of uh, what you should have as banks. And I still haven't done the bank one. So the first time I heard about you was actually I I saw your art at Dynasty Typewriter. There was a kind of like their B stage when they close the curtain and they have it on the other side and they're projecting your cartoons. Oh, cool. Like one of the early, early shows there. And I was like, it just blew me away. It was so good. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I don't even think I was there, but I'm glad that they do that. Oh, they, you weren't there? Maybe I was. I don't okay. know, but I don't remember that specific uh, night. But I love Jamie and Vanessa. And uh, Yeah, they're doing a great job over there. We, we just hung out last night at the Improv. He came down to, uh, I produce a monthly there at the lab. What's and it called? It's called Culture Lab. Culture Lab, yeah. cool. Is it ethnic people or what's going on? It's a diversity, yeah, it's try to be, you know, inclusive show, a lot of different ethnicities. And uh, Have you seen that one? I haven't even been yet, but there's a show called We Are Not the Same Person. Oh, yeah, that's, I, uh, that's I hosted a, that one time. Oh, really? It's such a funny concept because the poster, you'll see like six brown people that yeah. kind of do look the same, but then you look at the names, you're like, oh, they're clearly not the... Yeah, that's person, Zara Ali but... and a few other really talented comedians show. So, yeah. Yeah. It's really have you seen the show? No, I've just seen the flyer. Oh, but okay, I, yeah. I love the premise because it's so accepting of the fact that we're especially in LA and New York, if you're trying to be in whatever actor or comedian or anything, you're such a drop in the bucket and you really do have to be on it and offer something different. Whereas if you I don't know, maybe in Portland you were the only Egyptian guy or only Moroccan guy, only Iranian guy there. And you kind of, you build your identity around that, even though you're not putting that on the flyer, you feel it. You feel it, And you're like, I'm projected onto you. Yeah, Yeah, that guy's the big fat guy. That's the the trans person, the only trans person in town. This is the only, and then you kind of have your things. And then out here, there's, there's 50 of you. You go to a general casting, you're like, oh, I'm so replaceable. Right, right. Unless I really dig deep and find out what it is that... 
I am that's that other people aren't, which is where the doing multiple things comes in for right. people. If you if you play accordion and you like to juggle rubber ducks or something, then you're the only person that yeah. does that. It sounds quite corny when I use those examples, but no, it's true. I mean, I was definitely the only Moroccan person that I knew growing up in Vancouver and. I have this joke I do where I'm also say like, yeah, and sometimes I was also the Jewish kid, you know, like, <laughs> depending on who the bully was, you know. Are you also Jewish? No. Oh, that's But funny. like I would, be, yeah. or I'd be the Iranian guy. Oh or yeah, be, it didn't matter. I was I, Indian. I'm not uh, Indian, but growing up there, you or especially in Texas, you're you're just brown. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You're you're just they just know you as different. There's uh-huh. something different. We don't know exactly what it is, but we're we're gonna identify yeah. it and make you feel maybe a little different about it. Maybe sometimes you know in a good way, like hey, we don't know you. Let's learn about your food and this. And sometimes it's like, hey, let's get that guy. Or mostly it's, hey, let's get that guy. Yeah. Did you grew up in the '90s, basically. Yeah, I was born yeah. in '84, so oh, yeah. you know, first six years, you kind of remember the, I don't know, Prince Madonna and yeah, Michael yeah, Jackson yeah. are just kind of ingrained and video killed the radio star. That '80s vibe is deep within you. But '90s, I have the most memories. Right. Of. Yeah. Same. And it was the first year I knew what a year was. I remember in kindergarten or first grade or something were like writing down like 1990 and I remember just looking at him like what is okay what is this right this is the like 1990th year of yeah. what and then later on you learn like well it's it means uh AD but that doesn't mean after death it means like Antonomo Dominus or something before Christ is right. the thing before like oh it's based around Christ and then you're, oh Christ wasn't even born on that Day, and then it starts to get really muddy. Yeah. So what's your process for your art? Because like you, a lot of like, for those who don't know, Ramin did my podcast art. For yeah, show, show business. business. Did a great job. Thank you. A lot of different color variations. Too. Oh, yeah, the Thank whole you. rainbow. The whole rainbow. More to come. Uh, so are you using like a computer stylus? Are you drawing by hand on I paper? I start by hand. I start with a pencil, pencil sketch, and then I ink it with a micron pen anywhere from the 0.01 to the 0.8, depending on the you know radius you want of it. And then uh, I scan that in, and then I play with the colors in Photoshop. I'll color by hand sometimes, but it's just so much better to color in Photoshop. You can play with more variations and tweak it and it's more forgiving if you screw up a color in real life you're kind of done done. and uh, then from there if i animate it i'll use either flash or premiere or after effects or a combination of all uh, those looped into one and i've started playing with tilt brush a little bit on the vr thing but i haven't shared anything of that yet but i'm Hmm. moving into the the fourth or the third dimension oh, of, wow. of making a, a world you can walk in, which I think we're all heading into that, like the way we are in social media, where you see a window into that person's world. Right, like it yeah. might just be their food or their family or them yeah. on stage, but we're looking at a window on these little like glass screens and kind of peering into each other's lives. And I think we're going to have more control over that as time goes on. We already do. Oh, that'd be so cool to see like a visual thing you can walk through. Mm-hmm. And everyone's going to have it because the tools kind of close the gap of where your your talent is or where your technical skill is. I look at Instagram a lot and how it changed uh, photography. Before, only photographers knew about sharpness, warmth, saturation, vignette, sharpening, all that stuff. And Instagram kind of spread those terms around and allowed right. you to play it in an easy way without Lightroom. So now everyone kind of is a photographer yeah. from the perspective. If you went back in time to the 70s and started using the words that you know because of Instagram, they'd be like, oh shit, this guy's a photographer. How does he know all these? Right. It's just the same way we all know kind of audio. We all kind of know video. We all kind of, because of the iPhone. Yeah. Ba- all about that bass, no treble. That's like kind of audio engineer shit. But oh yeah. That, yeah, that yeah. spread it. And yeah, we know... Uh, uh, EQ and compression, a limiter, all those. Yeah, I think those ones are still not super. No, maybe place, not. But but know. definitely the the tools are getting more accessible to everyone. Yeah, and like I mean, I had a background as an audio engineer, so I'd spent a lot of time. Like, oh yeah, I see the platinum records on your hey. wall. Or uh, I don't know what they are. Oh no, yeah, they are platinum. Holy yeah. shit, gold and pra- platinum. Canada. <laughs> and so you started learning this thing. It's like a NASA console. With all the like, you know, little buttons and yeah. huge, and you have a button for everything. And now it's, uh, I was probably the, the last generation to learn analog. 
and now it's just all digital. What you can do on your phone is incredible. I use GarageBand. To, I'm like full Pro Tools guy, but like I use GarageBand to edit the pod because it's just so much easier. Yeah, Pro Tools is overkill. Why it's would overkill, you need it? Yeah. And the built-in plugins they have now sound great. They're like super quick, super easy. Yeah, only gets better. Too. I don't have to carry a little dongle with me uh-huh. like you do for Pro Tools, and oh, uh, then you update Pro Tools and your Mac doesn't work, and there's always compatibility issues. Yeah, and... I was always more a Logic guy. I have Pro Tools, but yeah. Logic is just so much more seamless. I just don't feel any friction there, and I hate friction when you're yeah. you shouldn't have to think of where the thing is or why the thing's not doing what you right. want. It should just kind of. I started out in of Pro you. Tools, so like I have friction with Logic. To mm. be honest, I'm always like, oh, how do you do that? Or because like Pro Tools, if you're fast, you can play it like a keyboard almost, like when you're recording vocals and stuff. Because everything is a quick key, so you're just like boom, 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 boom. And I did a lot of R&B vocal tracking, so so many takes, and you got to cut different lines. A lot of runs. A lot of runs. <laughs> a lot of yeah, <laughs> exactly. A lot of ad libs. Yeah. A lot of hand up while you're singing. <laughs> but uh, I don't miss it because like I feel like I, the last phase of my audio engineering career was me on a laptop. So it went from this huge, like, NASA, fun, buttons, everyone's in the same room, to, like, me in my apartment, like, making changes to a mix. Like, like the evolution of the computer itself. Yeah. And, like, you lost the human element. You lost, like, uh, we used to do rock records, like, nine months all together, like, eating sushi, going out, like, having a good time, like, 12 hours a day to make this project. And then at the end, we'd have 12 amazing songs, or maybe 14 cut two. Now that you're doing one song here with this producer, one song there, one song here. And that's fun too, but it's just as the engineering part of it, it wasn't as fun. Because we're not as connected. We're it's like, not as connected. It's not as like you're signed on to this thing. Yeah. You know it's going to come out. A lot of stuff now as an engineer, you'd be lucky if it comes out. You know, They record, like for most pop stars, 100 records easy. So 12 come out. So that's a math game. You're not going to win. Really? 100 records? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Because they're, they're getting all different producers and hits. I mean, not always, but a lot of time, like, they get just so many, so many, so many. Yeah. Where are you at with music right now? Do you listen to a lot of music, which is new, or do you tend to stick to your favorites? I kind of have my favorites. My I have my 90s favorites, but then, like, intermixed a few new stuff here. I mean, I grew up on like uh, hip hop and R&B, uh, so you know the sound has definitely changed a couple times. Oh yeah, uh, so like this, this month. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so some of the newer stuff, it's not really like I, I get it. I, I understand where it's coming from. It's just not really what I listen to in my free time. I uh, I try to do the Henry Rollins method of protein listening throughout the week, and then mm. the weekends you do the carbohydrate listening, which is your your favorite oh. records you know you love. And the great thing about protein listening is that if you find a new thing you love, it becomes a carbohydrate listening for the weekend oh, wow. because you might find a new thing. And it is difficult because it's so saturated, but um, it's kind of like there's this uh, David Bowie interview in the late 90s where he's... He's kind of predicting the future. No one saw it going this way where music was going to become this thing that we just kind of turn on a faucet and it pours out as opposed to having these idols that we follow and worship. Like, I'm an Elvis guy. I'm a Stones guy. I'm a... Kids don't think like that anymore. No, they don't. It's all consumable all the time. I remember just like to find... There'd be some records I just couldn't find. I'm like, I guess I can never listen to that. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't 80% of vinyl not digitized or some shit? Is They're, it really? That that's from that number's from 10 years ago. Who knows how much they've digitized now? But I know that there's a lot of vinyl that has not made it onto the the you know zeros and ones world. And oh, wow. I find that fascinating. That could be the case. Yeah, why would it all be digitized? Like who's who's in charge of having that all right. be and you know, limited releases, that kind of thing. Yeah. Huh. Well, I mean, the master wouldn't exist on the vinyl. It would exist usually on some sort of master tape. And maybe those tapes haven't been digitized for whatever reason. Maybe it's just they're like, hey, there's no fans for this. Or it's in the process of and someone's job is to go through like stacks and stacks of it and um yeah, I met an audio engineer who is doing some print stuff, and he's not allowed to bring his phone into Paisley Park or wherever they're oh, doing yeah, it. I don't yeah. even know if it's at Paisley Park. I think right. that's just a museum now. But uh, yeah, he can't log any of it, and he gets to hear all of those vault tapes. And oh wow, it's interesting. That'd he's be, like, yeah, that'd be crazy. I'm sure there's so much esoteric stuff Prince did. Mm-hmm. Uh, Prince is one of my favorites. Me I, too. I was still sad when he died. Oh, of course. Yeah. Dude, I go deep into it. I've watched every, okay, I can't say every, but I'm trying to 
every live recording, because remember, there was one live recording of him before he died because he was so litigious. He he said he had a team of fierce female black lawyers <laughs> that would take everything down like within 30 minutes or something. Yeah, yeah, and, and, he, and he would scour the internet. He would Google himself from what yep. I hear and like look for stuff. And then it all came out after he died. It's like you, you could only hold yeah. on to that uh, hole for so long. And um, what was I saying about that? Oh, yeah, so every live recording, and I even listened to uh, this one lady who channels uh, the spirit of him, which, disclaimer, like I said, with the aliens thing, no, of course you don't have to believe it's actually him or right. whether it's uh, a psychosis lady or it is his spirit or it's the larger consciousness system with all the data that was the human that was Prince just reflecting that data back to you and then the actual free will awareness unit that was Prince is off doing other things. But uh, it sounds like him. It sounds like what he would say. Wow. And it's, uh, so I'm I'm deeply... Uh, yep. So there's a psychic that yep. channels Prince's... Not like- just him, but a bunch of people. Oh. But she, has, she lives in Minnesota and she does have a very close uh, connection to him. It's called... Uh, Uh, above life channel the lady's name is bridget and she's channeled him uh a bunch of times and it it really does sound like what what he would say and whether you believe it or not it's still great advice i still (laughs) love tuning into it but i'm fucking crazy so what do you want (laughs) that's amazing uh, i gotta check it out it's so funny yeah or uh just the the wisdom that like you'll hear the david bowie one be like you know life is so short it really is just a blink of an eye it really is just a blink of an eye and uh, Prince Prince will talk about how, like, looking back on his career, his music was was about healing, it was it was about healing, and creative energy is very healing, and that does not mean fixing. Like, fixing is a different thing than healing, but it just it naturally is yeah. uh, ascending when you when you create new things. But Prince was also into the esoteric, and oh the, yeah, you know, was a Jehovah's Witness. Larry yeah. Graham convinced him over two years to become yeah, yeah. a Jehovah's Witness. Witness. Uh, I think he was vegan. Towards the end, I think so, yeah. yeah. But also Gemini and, you know, had the had the dark and the light. Right. So we don't know what his I mean, he died from a fentanyl overdose. Yeah. So he was he was abusing opiates and kind of kept that hidden from everybody. Right. And we don't know well, he what he was in pain from what? From his hips and yeah, yeah jumping off the scaffolding and doing oh the splits God. and oh. continuing to like watching those like Sign of the Times concerts or Purple Rain yeah. or Did you uh, ever see the one with he uh, Michael Jackson calls him on stage with James Brown. Oh, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's crazy. such a good video for those at home. Google that Michael Jackson, James Brown, Prince. Mm-hmm. Prince is like riding a security guard onto stage, <laughs> and he, from what I can tell, he looks kind of drunk. Yeah, or something. Yeah, drunk or I don't know. He's loaded for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Michael is not. Yeah, and it's interesting. Yeah, there was always that Prince Michael rivalry, and right. I think Prince clearly uh, won in terms of the perception of you know, his historical legacy. Yeah. With, I mean, yeah. Well now, especially with the Michael Jackson's legacy yeah. somewhat in question. Do you hear that Ian Edwards joke? I think it's on his new special where, uh, it goes, if you watch that documentary about Michael Jackson and still listen to his music, you are a monster. That being said, I have not watched the documentary, <laughs> nor do <laughs> I ever intend to. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I still hear it all around. So I think people are still, let, you know, holding on to it. The Wait, music. the doc? No, the music. I, oh, yeah. I, I think the music, I mean. It's not like R. Kelly where it's like, whoa, what are you doing? Yeah, but yeah. even R. Kelly, like, who cares? It's a sound file. Like, listen yeah. to it illegally. Like, you don't have to give them money. But as a as a piece of music, I don't think that the artist owns the music. I think they channeled it through them, and then it's right. in the ether. And then, I don't know, or even comedy. Like, I think it's okay to look back on a Bill Cosby bit and think that the bit was inherently objectively funny but not a proof of what the man did. Yeah. The biggest yeah. serial rapist of all time, right? Right. I think he's like Is someone he? was saying he's the he might be the the biggest of all time like numbers wise known. Wow. America's dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right under your nose. That's amazing. Don't believe like I would love to go to Paisley Park and check out the print stuff. I haven't been. I heard it's really cool and I heard his ashes are in it's uh, Chip Pope was telling me this. Chip's also a uh, comedian, really big yeah. Prince guy, was saying that on the tour, there's a room where there's a miniature model of Paisley Park, 
and just kind of nonchalantly during the tour, they say, and inside of the Paisley Park uh, is Prince's Ashes. And then on your left, you will see his uh, famous cloud guitar right next to his uh, Warwick bass, which, and they just kind of like gloss over yeah, it. Yeah, it's like, what? It's, <laughs> he's in, okay. Right. Everyone just takes like a lick, like yeah. a like a fun dip lick of his ashes. Mm. <laughs> Tastes like assless chaps. So interesting, though. He had no will. Just was so uh, was so about the now and yeah, eternal yeah. life. Like just never planned to die. Right. He probably thought he could live forever or a long time. Yeah. I Paisley mean, Park is in your heart. King of uh, Heaven is now. Do you ever see him live? No. Almost got to see the piano and a microphone tour, but didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm bummed. I never saw the one he did at the forum. He was there almost every day, and then you're like, oh, "I'll catch him. Oh, I'll catch." Him. And then yeah. it goes by. You're like, "Oh shit!" What era? This is like 2001, 2002. So music. Oh, sorry, 2011. Tour. Oh, 2011. That's the. Hmm. What was 2011? No, 2003 or six or something is musicology. Yeah, Eleven I saw is musicology. more musicology. Eleven. What would eleven be? Like Planet Earth, I think. Yeah, I think he was playing the hits too. Like, yeah, I was getting back into that. Yeah, yeah. Or the Vegas one would have been so cool at the Rio when he t- you kind of like have dinner with him. Oh, really? Yeah, he was at the Rio Hotel and like you kind of like got like a table and you would eat and then he would sing. And <laughs> from what I heard, I never got to see it. I saw him three times. I saw him at Staples Center. Cool. And the sound was terrible. Oh. Uh. And he just and he was stopped. He's like, we're gonna. We're gonna keep sound checking until we get this right, and he's like, hold, keeping the crowd energized and still being like, nope, nope, like yelling at the sound guy, nope, come oh, on, damn. nope. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool to see him like just take command of the situation, like both, like managing the crowd and the sound people. It was insane. It was intense. Yeah, that would have been interesting. Yeah. So many of those nights, like not recorded, that just one person, yeah. or not one person, but one group of people got yeah. to. Witness. And That's like comedy, though. Like some of the best comedy is like, oh, that one thing that happened that no one will get to see ever again. Most of it, yeah. Yeah. That's what's great about it. You have to be in the moment. Yeah. And so much of it, even if it is captured, it's not the same. Like no, when I look not. at these crowd work specials, I'm yeah. like, I get it. And it probably was fun there. But watching you on a little screen yeah. with distractions surrounding it, just it siphons some of the yeah, energy yeah. out. I like the way Schultz was doing it, cutting back. I don't know if you saw that one, but. I saw parts of it. I'm a fan of uh, him as a, like, as a philosopher, I guess, or not even, I don't want to, yeah, I guess somewhat as a- He's a a huge business philosopher, too. Yeah, exactly. The way he talks about the changing landscape, like his his bits in particular, I don't care for him, but I still recognize that they're good bits. It's just not for me, but I love- how he figured out YouTube and how oh my God. he learned that no one was watching the hour specials, but people were watching two hours of his five minute clips because you get to make the decision right. of, yeah, I'll watch this one. It's hitting the snooze button. It's having one more mini muffin. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Cons- a little bite size. Yeah. He said something that really stuck with me too. It's like, you got to earn the right for people to watch you for 45 minutes or an yeah. hour. It's like, start two, three minutes. Like, give them something. Like, who's just going to watch an hour of this person they don't know? Yeah, in today's society with the phone and et cetera, and we're all distracted. I can barely read books anymore. It's bad. And I was like a huge reader. I would read like at least fifty books a year. Damn. And now I'm book reading, a week. Yeah, like a book Two a week. Two weeks off. Exactly. And now I'm like a book. Uh, I'm not even doing a book a month if I'm being full honest. Yeah. But you're also a father, and you started a podcast, father, and you're podcast. doing a show. You're doing another show. Yeah, um, comedy, comedy bunker, which you did. Yeah, really I love great. comedy bunker. I love so that fun. house. I love the actual show yeah. part of it. It's two a year great... anniversary tomorrow. Year anniversary of it being a show. Two year anniversary. Two year. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's big. The paper anniversary. The brown bag. I don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Something uh, about that. Maybe you've read enough books, though. Maybe you you need to go through a like hibernation phase right. before you get back into it. It was a little. Honestly, you had this one art you did where it was like, if I just keep. Uh, reading more like self help books. I don't actually have to do the work or whatever. Yeah. It was something like that. And I was totally in that phase. Like I would just keep reading instead of doing. Yeah, it's a trap. It's a trap. Books are great, but it's also a trap. We all see the person who's, you know, a, a pure academic and not a practitioner and right. doesn't really know, but they're good at convincing you that they know, but they don't know. Yeah, because they haven't done or you just kind of, it's, you start to have all these tools that are just atrophy because you're not using them. You're just learning about doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It re- it reminds me of uh, like Tim Dillon once said like that, like, don't listen to me though. I don't, I don't know anything. Like if uh, what's, I forget their names, but the girls that do the, the podcast guys, we fucked, 
It's like, Ooh. don't, don't start a podcast called guys. We fuck. Don't, don't do that. That's not a good move. Like right. that advice would have been wrong. Or my favorite murder. Don't start a murder podcast. Right. No, wrong. If you have that yeah. instinct or kids, YouTubers don't start a slime show. Don't start yeah. a, don't, don't do anything really. Yeah. Yeah. You're, well, now you're we're wrong. in the long tail. So there's, there's room for all those podcasts. There's room for anyone to start something about anything. Yeah. And more, there's probably going to be podcasts about those podcasts. Yeah. The same way there's podcasts about TV shows right. from the nineties. What's next is, uh, I think there's a Joe Rogan recap podcast. Too. I'm sure. Why wouldn't yeah. there be, if there wasn't, then someone should start right. that. I'm not listening to it, but <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like that. Uh, Michael Garfield on future fossils talks about how like there's more people now studying ancient greece than there were alive in ancient greece oh wow like something like that i forget it's greece is the example or the renaissance or something like that maybe it's the renaissance but yeah since yeah. just population has increased yeah. means of learning about the thing has increased and so that might play out now where like yeah. there's seven billion people now doing whatever shit but there might be like a trillion people studying your life in a hundred years, just because they're they're you historians, like they find your life particularly interesting. Oh my and God. You started this, and the same goes for Beatles or whatever. Maybe yeah. they have like a gajillion, and then your trillion looks kind of small compared to their yeah. gajillion. But well, we're all doc. All of our lives are documented yep. in a way that like the ancient Greeks weren't. Like that's why Greece and Egypt is so fascinating to me, at least. Like it's all there, and. It all happens somewhat, and we don't know what happened. And yeah. we can like theorize, we can dig, we can try to put things together, tie different historical facts together, but we really don't know. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. And like how advanced like the pyramids? I've never been, but I'd love to go. Yeah, there's all kinds of wild uh theories. I don't I don't buy the I mean, I think the cement mixed one has been disproven or the carrying it with ropes has been disproven. Doesn't mean it's aliens, but they might have had some kind of um, one one kind of off the wall, but not alien theory is they like they had a better understanding of sound and they could like tune into what the the vibration of that stone was and give it like a counter thing huh. kind of somewhat anti gravity like zero point. So they, they tried that to basically bullshit make the pyramids again with the tech and they couldn't do it? Wait, who, back like, then or Like now? modern now? Is that Yeah, the- I think now it's still impossible even like getting it aligned to true north and having the the apex being like less than like 0.01 degrees from the base of the, the center, like so, something like that. Oh, the way yeah. in which it's perfectly aligned to the Orion's belt or whatever. See, I got to remember this stuff if I'm going to talk about it. There's There's that pyramid code. Okay. show on uh, Netflix, which is not Ancient Aliens. Ancient Aliens, I think, makes too many stretches. They'll pick up a bird statue and be like, this was a spaceship, and then there's a CGI right. sequence showing it as a spaceship. But I don't know. There's different levels of people being full of shit and yeah. actually what the truth could have been. But we're all like going to live on after we die digitally yeah. in a way that even the generation ago didn't. No. Like, how many dead people are there on Facebook? Mm. It's got to be like, Millions. Yeah, at least. Just sitting there. Yeah, I can think of like 50 that I know. Right. I, I mean, it's Remembering people. John Seward. Remembering LaShonda Lester. Remembering. And like, I'm sure at Andy some Ritchie. point people might already like programming like posts after you're dead. Oh, do you know what's really funny? Uh, someone, I mean, it's morbid, but it's very funny. But uh, my friend and comedian Andy Ritchie died in 2015 he had a brain tumor that like even after they raised the hundred grand or whatever to operate on it still wasn't successful and uh so i think three years after his death when his facebook birthday rolled around there's people still writing on his wall and there's messages they're like happy birthday bro hope is the best one yet like they're not even checking if if he's alive anymore oh, just the people so... that write happy birthday on oh everything like make it a great one hope is hope you party oh, just up. like <laughs> Uh, he <laughs> hasn't been here in three years. That's not what you oh, write. Oh man! Just they just see the little notification. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's his birthday. Wow. Mm-hmm. Just so that you're still relevant in your people's eyes. If you look at people as your followers, I don't think that's healthy because no, it's like we look at it. It's like, oh, I have four thousand followers, and you imagine you're this big duck, and there's four hundred little ducks following you. Right. But it's they're following other people too. They're not yeah, just following yeah, yeah. you. Exactly. They're, it's because it's digital infinite copy. So, mm-hmm. yeah, 
That's a really interesting. Yeah, people imagine themselves in an arena, like, oh, I've got 30,000 people in my arena staring at me. It's like, no, they're also looking around and they're not even fully. That's how self centered we are. Yeah. That'd be a good art if you haven't already done it. The the Oh, I've got all these, like, maybe not all of them. Sometimes I just think of stuff in the second, but I have so many things written out that I haven't made because of the time it takes to make them and just haven't gotten around to it. But. I feel like I've got something to the nature of that somewhere on a yeah, post. Yeah, yeah. And do you make one a week or do you have a system for I try a- to do every day? Every day. I've got uh I have the streaks app that okay. I use on uh you know, it's for phone or your tablet or whatever. And it's very minimalist, which is what I like about it. And you can pick six things that you make into your habits. And habits I believe should be different than your to do list. Okay. Because your to do list you might get, you know, task fatigue or decision fatigue right. if you're looking at yoga workout grocery blah 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 if, if things that you have to do every day are on your to-do list that's not healthy to-do list should be one-offs that you conquer and then they disappear mm-hmm. habit list is something you should try to have that chain that you don't break like seinfeld talked about going on stage every single day don't break the chain right, right? every day don't break the chain i have the uh Ooh, you got the, the, the calendar chain. with the chain box. You got the chain, it's, so you get the streaks. Got the streaks, but if you look at it carefully, a lot of missed holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's your war though. Yeah. It's it's about not letting. See, like I look at that, I don't give a shit. But to you, you're like, fuck, I missed yeah. Wednesday. I didn't have to miss Wednesday. Eh, I missed a couple months. <laughs> but as long as you don't let that uh, get you down. So it's got six spots on it, and I try to, or not try to. My thing is one art every day. Uh, the yoga every day, the meditation every day, the uh, weight exercises every day. And uh, recently, this has been incorporated in the last few months, but I used to write money on there and I changed it to wealth just because of the sub, ah, the yeah. subconscious uh, trigger of looking at wealth every day. And right. that's for people like me who are more on the right brain side and not left brain. And you might go weeks without looking at your bank account because right. you're afraid to, because you don't know what the number is. And you're yeah, afraid yeah. that if it's too low, it might trigger negative emotion, thus making you even less productive. So the productive thing to do is to not look. Right. And that's bullshit. You yeah. should just look at the account every and day. And own so, it, yeah. yeah look so at just, it, own it. Yeah, and look at it. Like maybe that check you remember, you deposited it. When is it going to go into the account? When is this going out? What subscriptions are you? Use mint.com or personal yeah. finance. But look at your fucking your yeah, money. Open, open your statements. Yeah, 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 look at it. It is painful. It right. sucks. Look Especially at in it. this subscription economy, that we've all been uh, convinced. Like I just got the Adobe suite and it's like, oh. 30 bucks a month or what? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And it's like every month, They've got you for the rest of your life now. Yeah. And they've convinced you just to like pay. Oh, it's just this. Oh, Netflix is just 15. HBO is just 15. And then you're like, wait, I'm paying like hundreds of dollars a mm-hmm. month. It can turn like that. Adds and then, up. Because you don't actually own it anymore. So our whole lives are being transformed from like an ownership economy, which is what our parents have. We own our car. We own our houses. To now, oh, you just need to rent. Oh, you don't need a car. You're just Uber. And all the wealth is being extracted by companies yeah so but we're also companies ourselves and uh do you think or i I think we're going this way where it's not going to just be uber and lyft as self-driving cars take off we're going to be able to rent out our car because it can drive itself and our cars are sitting around idle so much so owning a car not too far in the future might be like having a house that you can rent out airbnb style right so and People also subscribe to us, like in Patreon or stuff like that. So you're also the the perpetrator oh, that's, of that's a really of vacuuming. nice positive way of looking at it. Though uh-huh. yeah, you can be the subscriber and subscribe B. We're both. We're inhaling We're both. and exhaling Inhale, all day. Yeah, inhaling and exhaling. It's and like, yeah, we want it to be frictionless. And right now, there's a lot of friction because right. it's like, oh, overdraft. Oh, should I sign up? A lot of a oh, lot of hesitation. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. hopefully, we're just going into when we breathe. We might not breathe in the exact same amount every time we're just kind of breathing right like i think hopefully we're heading towards money being like money coming in all right i spent this on whatever yeah there's just there's money around we're not worried about air we're worried about air quality in 50 years but air we're not worried about the way we are about money right so money should be like air soon yeah that's why uber was so great It, it was frictionless it was like at the time there was no tip nothing you just did it you get in and out in and out that all goes to your automatic card app. They really had it down. What do you mean about now they don't? No, that, I'm just saying that's why it was so 
uh, powerful. That's why I took over, like from oh, taxis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Taxi was a pain. It still is a pain. Mm-hmm. Cash only. Yeah. But I like what you said about the inhale, exhale money. But I think what capitalism really is, is like your inhale and but you exhale less. Like it's always capitalism is about surplus, about capturing surplus from creating a company and having a product and that there's a margin. And that's really how our whole economy is based on is capturing like a margin of between your different sales and your different products and your inhale, exhale. Yeah. And uh, it's... it's kind of like one of those things. It's the best system we've had so far, and you, you never know. Like, what would it be in thousands? Is it going to last thousands of years? You don't know. No, we need something that uh, they're both different sides of the same coin, and they both lead to collapse with limited resources or with the, uh, you know, human fallibility. Like human fallibil- fallibility at the head of socialism or communism in every way it's been proposed so far probably wouldn't play out the way we'd like it to capitalism. We've seen the, the bad part of that. We've seen the bad part of socialism. That's why it's so easy for any opinionated person to kind of be like, Oh, you really think socialism works? Have you seen this? Or yeah, when yeah. capitalism doesn't work, we're just looking at the tent cities outside of. Right. Everywhere. I mean, it's, it's an identity, you know, mm-hmm. like socialism, capitalism, it's also an identity. So people get, Excuse me. They get really, you know, sensitive about talking about it. Like I am this one thing. It's almost like it's a religion in a way. It is. So you, you're trying to get people off of it, not knowing that our whole economy is hybrid socialism, capitalism. Like we have Medicare, Medi-Cal, you know, support for our you know public institutions. It's it's been a hybrid economy for yeah so much time. You know, we don't like to think of it like that though. No, the I same mean, way that we look at a red state and think it's red, but really it's forty percent blue and right 60% or like blue red. in the cities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or like Beverly Hills was actually voted red. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. It's interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, but most of the cities, even in Alabama, what's the capital of Alabama? Mm. Whatever it was, like you can most of them, you look at them and they're like, "Sorry, I don't know." Two Canadians trying to figure out capital cities in America, but I don't think the Americans would get it either. Uh, yeah. We have to learn the. It's funny in Canada, you have to learn everything, and here you just have to learn America. I didn't have to learn the American. Oh, it's the capitals really? No. Oh. Oh. I mean, I think like we need Washington D.C. and you know the rest of the stuff from movies, but definitely. Yeah, that's true. You Alabama, in, you wouldn't. You were Texas, so you probably you got it. Definitely. Texas, we had a lot of Texas history. Oh, yeah. And that's an interesting one. That must have been fun growing up there. A lot of Iranians in Texas, right? Zero. Zero? Or maybe oh, you left? There's like two. <laughs> oh. there's, that, there's not that many. Really? Not as much as here, no. Oh, uh, well, I mean, yeah, no. No, not, not where I was, at least. I was definitely one of, uh, I think, the only one. Maybe, wow. like, no, parents had friends from work, but it wasn't even full families. It's like a parent's friend from work's wife is Persian uh, yeah. and there's no kids. So it's just that, but it's, <laughs> I don't know. Persian is a weird, uh, ethnicity in yeah. that they don't, they, they tend to assimilate more than yeah. the other ones, like the Indians and Chinese and so many others, they kind of band together and they right. make that part of town. Yeah. I'm not saying one is better than the other. It's just kind of right. the way it is. And yeah. There's no Persian town. Yeah. The Persians like kind of change their name to, Oh, it's Tony, but yeah. your name is fat Tony, but it's like, yeah. no, I'm Tony now. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm like you, yeah. <laughs> just just completely <laughs> abandoning. Oh, sure, we do Christmas. Christmas is great. Halloween, happy Halloween. We order so ghosts from Amazon. Let's do it. And uh, I don't know. I like and they they like nice things a yeah, lot too. Yeah. A lot of Gucci, a lot of yeah. Mercedes. And I'm wondering if that's a, a Persian thing or if it's the the Persians that were that were fortunate enough to escape during the revolutions were one that had money to escape during the revolutions. Thus, the, the ones that we see here in the States have above right. a certain amount of money to be able to do that. Or if it's just kind of like how they are, they just like right. nice shit. That's, yeah, because I used to look around in the studios and there's a lot of Canadian like engineers and producers. Mm-hmm. And you're like, wow. And people are like, oh, well, Canadians are always so good. And you're like, well, yeah, the ones who left Canada exactly. got an exceptional artist visa to come here and live and work, yeah, they're great. <laughs> yeah, these are just the ones you see. You don't see the ones in the Labatt bar just <laughs> drinking that really watery beer. I've never had a Labatt. Labatt Blue. All right, maybe it's all right now that I go look at it now, but I just remember thinking like, oh, when you tried real beer and when you're growing up, you're just having the Canadian beer. Yeah. Like, do you ever go back? Haven't been in forever. Oh, no, I do go to see my grandma every, how often do we get to go? Like every year, if we're lucky. Um, and by lucky, I mean when... 
make the effort to get the tickets and stuff. I have to be better about planning in advance, getting the good price tickets. But yeah, I just, uh, I go to visit family. I don't really go as a comedian or as a vacationer though, which I should. Yeah, it's great. It's fun. I, um, Eddie and I did a comedy bar in Toronto and it was so fun. Yeah. I've never been. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so there's the Yuck Yucks, there's the comedy bar. Yeah. Is yucks there a big scene there? a little now? harder to get into, like on, the, on a whim, but a comedy bar has a lot of like great indie shows and stuff. You kind of need to be like a Yucks comedian. Do Yucks comedians break out at all or are they kind of in their own biodome? I don't know. Like uh, I didn't start comedy up there, so I don't really know, but I think you need to be passed by them in order to perform at their clubs. I don't know. Interesting. It's weird. I don't know. I feel like I'm past the age of uh, of joining a little group like that. Mm-hmm. Like I kind of did before, but when I look at the comedy store or something and I see like how much time the people that go there yeah. have to do to work up, I'm like, no, I guess that I'd have to reincarnate or some shit. I'm yeah, not I, going to. I'm not going to go do that. Yeah, I do try to stop by and do the FaceTime and like say hi and like yeah, that's it's, good. It's a bit. It's an investment, but. Every time I, I'm I'm about to drive there, I'm like, I shouldn't go. What am I doing? And I, every time I go, I'm happy. I like see some friends. I was like, Eat. it's fun. Yeah, it's I, got a weird energy. It's dark energy, but it's good. Yeah, and I, I I'm totally fine going anywhere for ten minutes. Like I don't need to spend the whole. I'm like, I don't mind. Like if I drive twenty minutes to spend ten minutes and leave, like it doesn't bother me at all. That's what's that's what here is about. Yeah, yeah, and I because I, I don't really drink or anything, so it's like. Did you ever? I mean, I don't not drink, but. I just don't, uh, it's hard for me to stay, uh, the comedy store is essentially a bar outside. Mm-hmm. So like, okay, after a certain point we're drinking or yeah. we're going home. Like, what are we doing here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause I you can't really, forever. you can dip your head into a couple of shows there, but not really. They're getting more secure security about it. Well, just, it's so popular. So, you know, they that's want That's true. It didn't yeah. used to be. I remember oh, it was yeah. empty as funk. That's the, uh, the the Rogan effect or what? Rogan effect. Rogan Dalia. Uh, maybe it's the podcast effect. Podcast effect. Rogan effect. And like all things celebrity, it's one of the you know marquee name clubs. So yeah. like everyone's gravitates towards going there. And it became like, oh, you want to go out to see comedy? Just go to the comedy store. Yeah. Plus the Bill Burrs. Plus Dalia. Plus Rogan. Plus. Rest in peace, Brody. Brody was my Brody, favorite yeah. part of the comedy store, and I feel like he's the spirit of the. You know, the after midnight, yeah, everyone yeah. leaving. Right, exactly. Like the actual side of comedy where the public sees the Seinfelds and Rogans and Bill Burrs and all that kind of stuff. I mean, Bill Burr, of course, had to struggle. All of them had to struggle yeah. to get up. But but Brody embodied that that struggle of what comedy's really like. Yeah. The I, anger and the... I, I don't think I ever saw him live, unfortunately. Oh, I mean, I saw his to. comedy store special. That captures some of it. His last yeah. Periscope captures some of it, but like we were talking about before, it really is in those moments, like yeah. when he would put the mic down and just start yelling at people, and yeah. like he was still he he wasn't completely having a manic episode, but it was coming from like a, a real place, place. Also, yeah. yeah. But you did well as a comedian, and you still do. You were on Late Night, right? Yeah, I did Ferguson. Uh, now it's the Late Late Show. Yeah, and. Uh, Let's see. I have one album out on Spotify and Tidal and whatever streaming things, iTunes. Um, I have another hour I haven't released, but I need to I need to uh, clean it up because I'm sure there's some there's 20 minutes of crap in there that needs to be just cut to work out it out. And, yeah, yeah. Or maybe maybe I'll just tape it as is and leave that 20 minutes of crap. Uh, well, what's your plan to to release it? Uh, to release it or to edit out the stuff or to work it out? I like to have raw in there but i also don't want to make it that like i know harlan williams released that one one where there's no audience in the desert or andrew dice clay did a album where he just bombs i respect the avant-garde art quality of that but i don't want to do that with this oh drew michael had one too yeah where he just talks to there's no audience like sure whatever i think it's stupid but i i have utmost respect for all of you for doing the avant-garde thing you probably think a lot of my choices are stupid too that's what's fun about yeah being different but for for this i want to just have a regular uh no no frills uh Uh, album of of the next material and then never do that material again kind of like we 
we have to do now. We can't yeah. be like Jay Leno and just do the hour forever. Has right. Come. And you're, uh, are you still a Canadian citizen? Yeah, I'm dual. Hey, so you can have Canadian radio support your album. Oh, yeah. I got to keep it clean. Yeah. Clean is so important. Like, I know that, I don't know everyone's finances or even the few people I know, but I get a kind of sense of the people that keep it clean get more rotation. Yeah, I think there's you get a few more spins, different uh, different stations, et cetera. Their checks are bigger. They just are. Yeah. Yeah. Sirius is no joke for comedians and checks and plays. It's pretty it's pretty desolate when you look at it. And think about when someone releases a comedy album, it goes to number one because there's so few. Right. Your yeah. comedy album goes to number one. Jim Gaffigan's is number two. John Mulaney, another Jim Gaffigan album from four years ago. Then yeah, whatever, yeah. but if you release an album today and you have somewhat of a of a following, yeah, on you'll any chart. Of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Even this pod charted first week, fifty three. Hell yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's new. Yeah, it's new, new and exciting. You get subscribers. Uh, I don't know how the algorithm works, but uh, yeah, there's not that many comedy albums consistently being put out. No, because it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. It's uh, it's a process. It's much harder than. Uh, just going up and doing a set, you gotta or you gotta prepare, you gotta engineer, you gotta do all that stuff. But yeah, you test. You have to test the jokes for a year. Yeah, and yeah. Even that's tough. To get an hour every year, you have to spend your whole time doing. Oh that. my god! I had this reminder on my phone, like that said, "Oh, you should have a new forty-five minutes by now." <laughs> <laughs> and I went. I like. I was like, "Well, I'm about halfway there." Isn't that a lot of pressure? Shouldn't you just try to do five minutes a month? Five times twelve. What's that? Sixty. Yeah, hour. Yeah, but do you find that works for you? Because I, 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 if you I, stick to it, yeah. But I don't, I don't have that uh, that system in place. But if I did, and I really committed to doing that yeah. five minutes, and was like, should I do this open mic? And then looked at, oh, I only have three and a half workable minutes. Yeah. I got to do the open mic. Got to do it. As opposed to, oh, I'll do it whenever. I think for me, I was thinking like, if I, because I have a lot of like short bits, like two, three minute bits, but like. When you're thinking like, oh, I need to have it as a chunk, as 45 or 25 or whatever, it's kind of like a different writing brain for me. Yeah. You know, like like really like tying it together. Because right now I have like, I feel like I have a solid 20 that I like and like another 10 that's like not integrated into that 20 at all. Do you get opportunities to perform longer sets? Because that's the only way I feel and you can really I, merge them. I mean, I've done some feature sets recently, but that's like 20... Ish. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of chances to do much more than hours that. are different because oh, yeah. uh, if you're if you're doing a five minute set, like percentage wise, it's okay to waste the first ten percent and last ten percent right. of that. But if you were to waste the first ten percent of an hour, that's death. Yeah, you cannot waste ten yeah. percent. But that. also, you have like the middle where you can kind of slow down and then you can rebuild and like you have a lot more like dynamic energy to like go different places and tell a longer story somewhere in the middle. Yeah. If five minutes, that's like boom, 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 boom. Good night. If they, and then you get to see if your attention really holds them. Yeah. Like if they, they, they might get, they might get the joke and the right. pattern. And do you ever just hear comedians cadences and yeah. how they're like, so my, my grandmother works at, at, at Wendy's. The interesting thing about Wendy's is they, they like have yeah. it set up and then they go into, I sounded like Joe List there for a second, but I wasn't trying to sound like Joe yeah. List, but you can, you can feel their cadence and get bored of it. And well, you can also fall into it and then you then you start to laugh. I feel like the audience can fall into it and then they're like, they're in their rhythm. And so yeah, they that's know the when good to side. laugh too. That's the good like, side oh, okay, of it. Okay, cool. They, oh, they know. And then they can start slotting in sometimes jokes. They're like, yeah, it's a B joke, but it's getting like an A minus laugh because they're in the rhythm. Yeah. Like Mitch Hedberg was really good at putting you in that trance to where he would just do, like, I, I think orange juice should come with a uh, f- fucking, I fucked that up. And then, like, that gets a laugh. Just yeah. his, his beingness is funny. Yeah, exactly. Oh, he's, he, I, he has that thing. It's like when you walk on stage, he's funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's a powerful. I, I know, like, I don't have that. I'm like, I got to go up there and, like, and earn it, you know? And I, I do work clean. So, were you funny growing up? Uh, I think so. People Would your friends to- say you're funny? People always told me I should do stand up. Okay, that's my good. Whole life. And I was like, well, that's not a job. I that's a like, that's a really good attitude, too. Like, I was like, that. I didn't even understand it. Like, I couldn't even comprehend. And then uh, I think I told the story before, but uh, I had a friend who was friends with Wiz Khalifa and I was working with his label and I met him at the Laugh Factory and he 
took me around to all the clubs and showed me, oh, this club, this is how it works. You get paid like $10 here for a set, 12 bucks. It's like, oh, they drop in. He's like, come check out Roast Battle. Come check out this. And he showed me the whole landscape. And I was like, oh, wow, it's really not a job. This is really terrible. <laughs> but then I, it was too late. At that point, I had written some jokes. And then I was like, let me just do an open mic, see how it goes. And it went well. And I'm like, all right. No. What year was that? It was 2016. 2016? Oh, yeah. so you're still pretty new. Yeah, I'm, I'm my third year. Damn, what's it like starting after after social media has already sunk its teeth into everybody. Yeah, it's interesting. I started when there was MySpace. Oh, my God. And MySpace was, I don't know, it's it was a different feeling than, yeah. than this stuff. There was no news feed. Right. We would just check it. Yeah. But even for the Comedy Bunker, like it took me a while to even put myself on my own flyer. Oh, really? That would you just, still host? Yeah, I'd still, I'd still be there hosting. You just were afraid to put your face next to the people. I was just like, eh, I'll just not... Uh, and people are like, "What are you doing? You got a promo?" I was like, "I don't want to do all social media stuff." And like, "No, no, you have to. You have to do it." Mm-hmm. And then uh, now I'm like, "Okay, now it's like pretty much all I post, which feels weird." Also, <laughs> <laughs> what in your in your head? What would you? What do you wish you were also posting? Um, if it took no extra time, but you just, just close your eyes and it snapped into existence. I think like I would like to capture more like in between moments of my life. Right now, it's just like here's come, come check out this show. Here's me on stage. Come check out this show. Here's me on. That's like my all promo. Yeah, it's all promo. But uh, I also I don't post any pics of like my family or my kids. And I know people are so transparent with that stuff. And for me, it's still like uh... some people are. I think it's I I could argue either way. Like yeah. of course, no problem with not having everything about your family public in case. Yeah. I don't know. There's some bad people in the world, or yeah. there's some trolls. Yeah, and I feel like it should be the kids. As my perspective is like, let the kid decide if he wants to be on your feed. Or there's not. people who's like in vitro fetuses, like has an account already. Ugh. It's insane, That's or maybe nuts. not their own account. Sometimes their own account, but sometimes their parents are like, "We're six months in," and then they're yeah. like, "Holy shit, they're on Facebook before they even existed." Yeah. Do you schedule like? You post very consistently. Do you have a certain time when you do it? Or? I used to. I used to feel like it mattered, and I think it's. I think it's the end of history now. And uh, how many outrageous things have I said on this before? But I don't think it it matters time of day. And I look at the insights, and it's kind of yeah. It does, however, it does. Like maybe if I post it at eleven thirty. It won't ramp up as quick, but then the next morning people will see it because whatever bullshit the algorithm right. feeds you based on what you've done before. So I just put it out whenever. Whenever you feel. Yeah, yeah, when it's done. That makes sense because it's so algorithmically based now that like... Used to matter. Used to be good to have it every Monday. Tune in to Monday's yeah. Monday show. Now, like, yeah. who cares? What day is it? It's Tuesday? I don't know. I try to post in the morning so I can get done with it. That's and good. Like, I'm, I'm definitely going to get that app, the Streaks app. So on on it, I'll have do my posts on Instagram, Twitter, right. Um, when, on Tom Papa's podcast, I think it was Jerry was talking about writing, and he's like, "I want to write like four hours a day or whatever," and he's like, "I can't do that," and he's like, "Well, wait a minute, if I can't do it, who can do it?" Like <laughs> he gathered all his. Wait, assist- who said I can't do that? Uh, Seinfeld. Seinfeld said, I can't write four hours a day. Not because he can't physically do it, but he's a busy guy. Oh, he's like, yeah, I got a family, blah, blah, blah. He's like, wait, if I can't do it, I'm paraphrasing too. If I can't do it, who can do it? So he like gathered his team of assistants and said, hey, this is, the, and his wife or whatever. And he's like, hey, this hour to this hour, I'm writing. You can't, you're not going to get a hold of me. Ooh. This is the new system. Go. That's great. Isn't that's, that great? That's like Maya Angelou. She would get a hotel room and lock herself in with yes. no phone or anything. Yeah. But like for me, the day goes so quick. It's like, cause I do drop off with the kids. Then it's like, okay, uh, get a coffee or something. If I do social media and if I slip into email, the day's done. Oh yeah. Yeah. I like Chuck Palahniuk's frame of mind in that, uh, he says what most people consider writing, he considers typing and typing should just be done when you're stuck on a plane or something and real writing is sloppy it's on a napkin it's on a notebook you carry around it's Ah. in your your notes and generally you should not write new ideas in a word processor because if it's that times new roman font and it's perfectly spaced it feels done if it's your sloppy handwriting it doesn't feel done so you can move it around a little bit more and you have more freedom in your head and that's where the real writing happens not like in this cold like huh the other day, I noticed that it, it already sounds just mechanical. You want yeah. it to be this very, 
you style thing that's right. kind of wrong in a way. Like anything that has its own style it must be wrong. Right. Because there's the dumping of ideas and then there's the editing of those two brains. Like, so you don't want to edit while you're being creative. Yeah. So let it all come out and then edit it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think on Rogan he talked about this app, Scrivener. I don't remember that, that but I love that episode with him. I've like referenced every story from it. Which episode? The Rogan Chuck Palahniuk episode. Oh, I didn't even know he was on there. Oh, wait, what were you talking about? I was about? just talking about on Rogan in general. Oh, he talked about Rogan this app. Oh, Rogan talked about that app. I'm oh, def- okay, what, what did he talk about? So there's an app called Scrivener. It's basically, it's like a word processor plus notes app kind of. And because I love Evernote, but Evernote, you can't organize yeah, the notes clunky. in order. So this is like Evernote, but like, it's almost like for stand up. It's like so great. You can put things in folders. You can organize it the way you want. It's an app. It's an app. Scrivener. The one downside is its sync between the phone and the computer is terrible. It uses Dropbox. <laughs> so if you close your laptop and you haven't like waited for Dropbox to update, you're, it'll fuck everything oh, up. Oh, I hate that. But other than that, it's great. I highly recommend it. I'll check it out. Yeah. I might not need it, but I still like to play with as many softwares as I can. So I have two. Like I use paper and like my notes app on my phone to like get ideas. And then when it's time to like edit them, I put it in Scrivener and trying to like find a spot in my act of where, oh, this could kind of maybe tie in with this and that. Do you self filter? Do you ever write something and you're like, that doesn't fit my persona? That's too mean. That's too. I don't know. Yeah. Hurtful. Yeah, I do. And then like sometimes I'm like, let me try them. And for the most part, they don't work. It's kind of like Seinfeld is another one. It's like the audience will tell you what's funny about you. Mm. And sometimes I do stuff that's a little too like and like stuff about sex or stuff about like too uh, if I swear, people are like, hey, whoa, that's not you. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. yeah, getting that motherfucking pussy up in here, right, yeah. bitches? Right. That's so if I was out there like that, people were like, "What are you?" Doing? That's not, yeah, yeah. So or it could just be my own editing of myself, but yeah, yeah. I love the wrong stuff. I love the problematic comedy, but I also respect that there's a there's a place for the safe spaces. And I try I try to uh, I might have talked about it somewhere before, but how. Like Nanette came out, yeah. the Hannah Gadsby special, and then half the people are like, this sucks, this isn't a comedy, and then half the people love it and are like, this revolutionized shit. Yeah. And it's got 0% on Rotten Tomatoes audience score and 100% on... That's trolling. It has to on be. On critics. Uh, no, the critics all loved it. Yeah. And then the uh, audience score, the people that took the time to go rate it as an audience generally don't like it. Yeah. And then you look at that new Dave Chappelle special, Sticks and Stones. Yeah. Very, very low critic score, very high audience score. So it's almost like the the polar opposite. Yeah. The the powers are balanced. There's this very uh you know, not not problematic joke one, one that gets very serious and emotional and uh, addresses serious things. And then the other one where Dave Chappelle is doing like a bad Chinese accent and right. saying like uh, hey, there ain't no such thing as good 36 year old pussy and then runs off and yeah. just stuff like that that people would close their ears I love that both of them yeah. exist because then everyone has their uh, their comedy and they, yeah. there's room for both of them to, to be I didn't understand the thing about the net like I was like, I, I like, why is this not comedy? Like, she was doing jokes. I mean, it because was- there's a section where she wasn't doing jokes and was uh, being vulnerable. Yeah, but that was just part of it. Like yeah. over it was the microphone, she was getting laughs, like Yeah, but I guess if you're looking at it from like laughs per minute or some bullshit yeah, then but that's her like, choice. You yeah. know, like yeah, you don't have to get it, you know. Is it maybe it's a stand up special with something else and kind of that's how you cut through the noise anyway. It hit yeah. a nerve though. Both those specials hit a nerve. Yeah. And like whether I know people who hate it and they didn't even see it. They're like they're writing this diatribe about why they hate it and they yeah. haven't even watched the special. I thought they were both great. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, did you see Joker? No, I haven't yet. Oh, okay. I hear it's good. It was good, yeah. I liked it. I won't do you any spoilers, but uh, Ooh, there's spoilers. I like that. Oh yeah, people I mean people were like, oh I'm having nightmares like uh you know, I can't watch it. It was so violent. I would love to have nightmares, man. I don't I don't think I Yeah. I'll I just think- I'll just say it was not that violent at all. Uh, you know, I, th- I was picturing like Saw or something where it's just like all n- nonstop gore, but it was just a normal movie. Oh, okay. But great. And comedians are in it. Real ones? Yeah, Sam Morell's in it. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, won't, I won't spoil the rest, but uh, 
man, I want to see it just for that. Yeah, you just, <laughs> as, as a comedian, you kind of have to see it. Now I, I know why all the comedians were seeing it. I was like, oh, I don't really care about the Joker. Who cares? And they're like, oh, it's got a big, he's a stand-up comedian in the movie. Yeah, a failed stand-up comedian failed, in yeah. cell or something. Right, yeah. I, I do like, uh, I like Joker. I like the Heath Ledger, Ledger Joker. I like the Jack Nicholson Joker. Yeah. I like the 60s campy Batman Joker. Yeah, I haven't seen the the Jared Leto one yet. but No, I never saw Suicide Squad. It's cool art direction. He looks yeah, cool he looks with the cool. tattoos and the teeth and whatever. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. sure it's good. It's I'm sure all, it's good. It's all just little action figures that we grew up with, and now we're. He'll forever be the guy in Fight Club who gets his face punched in for me. Really? Yeah. That's Jared Leto. Yeah, the blonde guy. That's the blonde guy. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah, cool, right? That's really cool. I just yeah. didn't know that. Didn't know it either. Yeah. When did you know that? I don't know. I think I started saying, like, I don't get him. And then people are like, oh, he's the guy in Fight Club. I was oh. Like, oh, really? I was like, all right. I yeah. wonder if we have this ingrained sympathy for him because we all know him as the, and you are too fucking blonde. And then oh, yeah. that's his. Such uh, a good film. Face beat in. Did you ever read the book? No. I read Choke. And How I read, was that? Uh, it's good. And there's one other Chuck book, the one with the short stories in it, Guts. Oh, yeah. Uh, what's it called? I don't know. But I. I've I've like read parts of of his books and I like him as a guy as a as a writer. He's just a legit writer and lo- like that's all he's ever wanted to do and has so many great insights about about writing. But yeah. never and there's there's graphic novels now, Fight Club two and three. Oh yeah, right because it was like Fight T- Club two is coming out and I was like, oh, it's a graphic novel. I was like, ah, oh, I don't care about graphic novels. <laughs> Um, we always ask guests about like investing. Have you ever thought about like investing in like stocks or anything? Or, like, I used you- to. I haven't in a minute, but I used to be pretty, pretty safe. Not like super safe. I mean, I've got a Roth IRA. That's that's an investment. I've got yeah, a, that's house. a smart one to have. I've got a house in Austin. That's an investment. Oh hey. I used to buy like um, stock in uh, AMD, and I would kind of do some research. And when there was a new gaming console that was going to come out when like PlayStation or Xbox, when they were deciding whether they were going to use the Intel chip or the AMD chip, that chip that they chose would go right. up like from three to five. So you could, you know, invest three grand and have five grand minus whatever tax thing you have to pay out of, right. uh, what's it called? Income, not income, uh, capital earned, gains, capital tax. gains yeah. tax. So AMD little, was always like, it's always been floating like single digits. I don't know where it is right now, but um, yeah, because like Intel was just dominating. They almost went out of business, but they, yeah. they came back in a big way. Recently. Also, PacSun. I would invest in PacSun before the summer, and then it would spike up a little in the, the summer. Sunscreen? Yeah, or just the store. Oh. They would, uh, you know, it's board shorts and summer wear, like one of those stores in the mall, huh. Pacific Sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. PSN or whatever it's called on the thing. Interesting. This is stuff I just learned from Reddit, like, and then it sounds true. You're like, okay, I'll try it out. And then right. you try it out and then you you make money. Overall, I won. I lost sometimes. Overall, kind of ended up winning, but never a huge, like, life-changing Right. N- never did the penny stock thing. That just no, I mean, sounded... That's, that's gambling at mm-hmm. a certain point. I mean, it, anything short term is usually has a gambling component to it. Yeah, and cryptocurrency, I just end up spending all the time, like because oh yeah, if, if there's if you're buying something from a store where it gives a discount for crypto, I just have to do it. So I end up just never having crypto, which is also good because I know people that have lost like sixty grand or something from their crypto. Oh my god. Even Venmo, like when I Venmo people, I'm like this isn't real money. Oh, can you Venmo me twenty? I'm like, sure, whatever. <laughs> like, it's just buttons. Like, I mean, yeah. yeah. I, Yet it sometimes I want to go back life. to cash and just be like, I'm carrying the cash, and then it's in my pocket. And like, I'm not gonna get rewards or anything, but like, I feel like I'll overall I'll spend less money. Yeah, that's true. I've been thinking a lot lately about like things I should pay people to do that I don't. Like, should I be paying people to do like laundry? Should I be paying people like to do things like? If I really t- put like a dollar value on my time, or like, or is it just part of the human experience? Like, I should do my own laundry. I should like, you know. I think you could rock it both ways. There's people that micromanage every second of their day, and they wear the same thing yeah. every day, and they eat the same thing for lunch, get up at the same time, same workout routine, all that, and uh, so then their decision 
fatigue is minimized and right. all their time is yeah, spent yeah, like doing what they do. Same. Yeah. I did that for a while. I had this black shirt. These are the jeans I'm wearing. That's it. But you, it's kind of like, I don't know, something about that feels like, you know, at a certain point you just have a stick up your ass and you're like, my time, I only have so much time on this yeah. earth. And I, I was talking about this the other day where I, I talked to someone that was like, well, we don't like to waste time around here. Yeah. And as he said that, it kind of activated something in me where I was like, I actually kind of do like wasting right. time. I love just throwing some of it away. There was this, uh, you know, those like British shows like Downton Abbey or whatever. Uh-huh. I can't, I wish I remembered the one it was from, but maybe a listener will know. Uh, it was the rich English guy was like, oh, there's nothing more pedestrian than like being efficient. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, there's something to that. Like, yeah, like worrying about being efficient, you know, and like with your time or whatever. It's like they're like living their life like well because they don't care about being efficient. Uh the the status symbol of wasting yeah. your time. And it wasn't like burning money or buying anything. It was just a, it was just like because at the time when they had less things, less physical objects, but like it was like being able to be comfortable in your leisure time and comfortable like not trying to extract everything out of every moment. Yeah. It does have this kind of evolutionary biology feel to it where what like peacocking syndrome or yeah. I don't know if it's called syndrome, but the the peacock is not getting an evolutionary advantage by having a big uh, feathers with all the colors. It slows them down. It's not good to avoid predators, but in doing that and putting that handicap on yourself, you're saying, I'm so fucking fit that I can have like this big feather thing and still yeah. be alive. Like you want my genetics. Like this yeah. is the shit. But that's what uh Rolls Royces are and stuff. Exactly. Like, yeah, it's yeah. like I have enough that I can waste. It's a signal to the other gender. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. There was uh I talked about this on my podcast, the uh, I forget the guy. I should look up who fucking said this, but the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. You you know that rap uh-huh. where it's Apple, Google, Facebook, and uh, let's see, Google, Facebook. Amazon. Apple, Amazon. Yeah, yeah, Amazon is the gut. Facebook is the heart. Yeah. Google is the brain. Apple is the gonads, the yeah. status symbol, the clean, uh, yeah. chic, they did More another expensive. one that was cool on the cover of The Economist. It was like they were like little countries, like Apple, India, and like things Ooh. were happening, like Google Plays, and like they had them kind of like mapped out. It was which, really- which countries were what? Apple was India. I can't remember which one. Who I was mean, you what. can make any metaphor you want, I guess, but I love seeing different ways things can yeah. be cut up into a simple. Yeah. And then Microsoft, you can't forget about Microsoft. Like they're just kind of like, oh, we're not big, but they're a secret, like huge, huge oh, in the yeah, cloud. Yeah, we forgot about that. Microsoft them. is number two in the cloud behind Amazon. Uh, Bill Gates, uh, it's kind of doing a short profile of his uh, childhood and why he is the way he is and yeah. the conflict with his mother. And, you know, he's a nerd and always wanted to work on shit. And recently he's been devoting his energy into solving problems. Uh, polio or something yeah. and whichever one causes diarrhea death in impoverished countries yeah, diphtheria or something I don't know. yeah and it's been solving that and came out with the then his next step after that was having like small scale uh radiation free nuclear power plants or something huh. in china but since the trade deal with china got something with trump stopping it they had to hold back on it so now they're in limbo of right solving that. and impossible burger and oh, beyond burger i think he invested yeah. in both Imp- impossible i think that's episode 3 oh wow so yeah he's he's working on the big uh make the, the world a better stuff. place thing yeah uh tell people where they can find you and your art you got to pick up some of Ramin's art for your apartment or your home yeah buy that's a shirt buy a, book, buy a shirt buy a sticker take out your kids college fund yeah. send it my way um subscribe to the patreon I'm yeah. on uh, Instagram. It's just my name, Ramin Nazer, R-A-M-I-N-N-A-Z-E-R, uh, or rainbowbrainskull.com is where I post all my my books. You can read all the books for free, and if you want to own a physical copy, you can buy one. Yeah, and come see his stand-up. Convince him on Twitter. to Yeah, come on October 30th to a Comedy Bunker. It's a special once-in-a-lifetime uh, show. Seinfeld, me, um, Bill Burr. <laughs> uh, we've got, we've got. That's uh, uh, tomorrow. They won't. This is all. Dave won't. Chappelle. Yeah. One day, one day we'll get a big drop in. You know, after Mark Normand was at the comedy bunker, I went down with him to improv. He's 
just to hang out. And I go in and the door guy grabs me. He's like, hey, I got to talk to you. I was like, oh, shit. I was like, what did I do? And he's like, come over here. And he's like, hey, Rogan's talking about the comedy bunker. Oh, cool. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, he's talking about it. You got to go talk to him. Make sure you talk to him before you leave. So he's over there at the bar, like holding court, and like Norman's next to him. So Norm, I go over and say hi, to Norman. And Norman's like, hey, it's Rogan. And Rogan's like, oh, yeah. Mark was telling me about the comedy bunker. He's like, I would have come in the car with him to do it. He's like, I'm like, yeah, anytime. Just let me know. And it was, it was surreal. And he was a really nice guy. And Oh, yeah. He's a brick wall. Yeah. And I, I was amazed. He goes in for a hug, and it's just like, no. I didn't hug him. I just took his hand. But like, I didn't see any security, but just so many people, like fans, like trying to like angle to talk to him. And he's just so cool and just relaxed. I was like, wow, I'd be freaking out if like all these drunk people were trying to talk to me. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. used to it. Yeah, yeah. And just, I think, has that intense personality that knows yeah. he could handle himself and put you in a triangle or whatever. <laughs> put yeah, you in an arm bar. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. Two seconds. Yeah. But we'll see. Oh, we'll see you at the comedy bunker. Yeah, on, I'll drop in. On the 30th. Oh, that's where you're plugging. The 30th. Yeah. Oh, shit. I don't even know my own show dates. <laughs> so it'll be a good, it's a Veil comedy night. There's going to be a costume contest. Cool. From the comics or from the audience? Uh, if you want, you can, but uh, mostly audience. And so it's going to be a super fun time. Uh, we'll post all the links to the shows. And uh, thanks for me and for coming through. Thanks for gosh. having me. It was a pleasure. 